Good evening. My name is Jerry Kossoff. I am one of our AP statistics uh, streamers. That's the word, streamers uh, here at Fiveable. Um, and this evening, we're going to continue our series on exploring bivariate data via scatter plots by discussing what are called least squares regression lines. So we're going to introduce what those are and uh, learn how to use them today. I'm really excited to do this. Remember to uh, follow us at Think Fiveable for all of our uh, AP statistics content. Um, this is part two of a three-part series. Um, we're going to make a point of starting by reviewing some of the stuff that was discussed in a previous stream, uh, how to describe association that we see on scatter plots. Um, and so we'll discuss the different things you need to put in your response if you're looking to get AP credit. And then we're actually going to get into using least squared regression lines. Uh, we're going to learn what they are, define them, use some notation. Uh, we'll talk about how they are used to make predictions uh, about response variables given certain values of explanatory variables. We'll go over those words again if we need to. Um, we'll talk about this thing called extrapolation. Uh, we'll interpret the slope and intercept of regression lines, a lot of things to do with those. And then we're going to meet these things called residuals. We'll define those. And we'll learn how to calculate and interpret those in the context of a situation um, and also discuss these things called residual plots. Okay. And so um, please be sure to ask questions, um, put anything that you want in the in the chat on the side to make sure that I, I get to everything that you want to hear. Um, if you need to rehear a definition or have me go over something from a previous stream, um, be sure to be sure to ask. Um, otherwise, I'm going to do this as if um, people are watching this on replay and you can use the timestamps along the bottom if you're watching this on replay. Um, but to begin, uh, last time we met scatter plots. So we've got uh, two quantitative variables that we're measuring. In this case, the scatter plot on your screen shows the height of 12 students as well as their arm span, so the length uh, from one hand to the other if you measure it out, uh, and it plots them on a scatter plot for us. The height is going on the x-axis, that will be our explanatory variable, and the arm span is going on the y-axis to represent our response variable. And if we were to describe the association we see on this scatter plot, we have to talk about three key things. We need to talk about the direction that the uh, relationship is, whether it's positive or negative. We need to discuss the form of the relationship, whether it is a linear association or nonlinear association. And we need to describe the strength of the association. That's whether it's strong, moderate, weak. Um, and if you were here last time, or if you've watched a replay, you know that for this particular situation, I could say something like there is a positive, linear, and moderately strong association between height and arm span for the students in the sample. And that hits all the things we need to hit if we're describing association between two quantitative variables via a scatter plot, where we've talked about what direction is the association moving in as one thing goes up, does the other go up or down, positive or negative? Is the association appear to be linear, like I could draw a line through it, or does it appear to be nonlinear where I could draw a curve or some other shape through it? And then how well does the data actually match the linear or nonlinear form? Is it a strong association where it really looks like a line or is it relatively weak? Okay. That's what we did last time. Today we're going to specifically zoom in on linear association and specifically start talking about regression lines. So you should see the same scatter plot on your screen right now with a line drawn through it. Okay. And you notice it, the line kind of goes through many of the dots, not necessarily through it, but kind of fits pretty well with the data. You can draw a line through it and you see, you know, many of the students' actual heights and arm spans are lined up pretty closely to where that line is. It is called a least squares regression line. In a previous algebra class, you might've called it a line of best fit. And what it's doing is quantifying the linear relationship that we have between these two variables. So there's actually gonna be an equation for this line that will help model the data that we see for the height and arm span of these students. We're gonna be able to use these regression lines to help make predictions for values of the response variable given another value of the explanatory variable. In context here, that would be like, predict the arm span of a new student who's not represented in this data set who is 65 inches tall. And there's a couple of ways we can do that. We can do it graphically by just kind of lining up where 65 would be on the x-axis and bumping up onto the line and looking over and seeing what the uh, response variable would be or we could actually use the equation that is uh, given to us in a situation. Okay, and the parts of a linear regression line, the equation looks like this, okay? It's y hat equals a plus bx. The little thing on top of a y is called a hat. A little strange. 
Okay, but the x stands for the explanatory variable. So in this case, height. The y hat stands for a prediction, the predicted value of a response variable. The actual values of the response variable are the dots themselves. So you see it, there's a student who is 62 inches tall. It looks like their arm span is about 61 inches based on the scatter plot. If you look at the point 62 on the x-axis, lines up to about 61 on the y-axis. Um, the prediction will be based on where the line is when x is 62. Okay, A is the, what's called the intercept or constant. It is gonna be the predicted value of the response variable when the explanatory variable has a value of zero. May or may not make sense in context. We'll get to that a little later. And B, that thing in front of the X, just as you learn in algebra, is the slope. It is in context of regression, it's gonna represent the average predicted change in the response variable per one unit change in the explanatory variable. We'll do some examples of this later in context and look at some like writing templates you can use. Um, but for now, these, this is what an regression line looks like. Here's a specific example of one for this situation where y hat, the predicted arm span, is gonna equal 11.74 plus 0.83 times the given height of an individual or times x. The actual mechanics of where those numbers come from is a little bit beyond where AP statistics usually goes. It's more important for us to be able to understand how to use this equation and to understand the different parts of the equation. So for example, if you need to predict the arm span for a student who is 61 inches tall, well, 61 inches tall, inches tall would be height, so the x would be 61. So this is a straightforward algebra situation where you evaluate y hat when x is 61, and busting out our calculators for a second, verify the math here, we can see that the predicted height is a little over 62 inches, 62.37. Okay, and if you try to line up um, with your eyes at x equals 61, and go up to where the line is and look over on the y-axis, you'll see it's gonna be really close to 62, maybe a little bit over 62, in fact. Okay, if you're watching on replay, I'm gonna give you another one to do by yourself here. So we've got a situation. Um, here's the regression line. You can see it on your screen now. And the situation here is that if you're competing in the long jump, track athletes sprint down a runway and then jump into a pit, and a coach is noticing a negative association between how long it takes to complete the sprint, our X variable in seconds, and the distance that an athlete jumped in inches, um, that's the y response variable, as shown by the scatter plot. You also see an equation. So let's start by predicting the jump length for an athlete who can sprint down the runway in 6.1 seconds. And I'll give about 20 seconds here um, on, the, on the stream for you to come up with an answer before I reveal the answer. Hopefully you've had a chance to pop that into a calculator. You should get about 135.776 inches. In some situations, it's okay to round that and say it's about 136 inches. Um, but you'd wanna ensure that you've got um, your significant finger, so to speak. Um, and we can see that on the graph. If we try to line up where 6.1 is and then actually go over towards the y-axis, you see it's coming in a little under 140. Not an exact visual on your screen right now, but you can see that the line also matches up with that prediction. Okay. If we actually then try to look for real athletes who are represented in this data, if there's actually an athlete who took 5.7 seconds to do the sprint and jumped 131 inches, that athlete is represented by that circle. Now the question becomes, did that athlete actually jump farther or shorter than predicted by the least squared regression line? Okay, and hopefully you'll be able to see this visually as well as with the equation. Okay, but if you evaluate the regression line at x equals 131, you will get about 154. You can see the dot is below the line. So the actual jump was shorter than what the line predicted for someone who could run the sprint in 5.7 seconds. And it turns out it's about 23 inches shorter if you actually do the math there. And this is a preview of something called residuals that we will see later in the lesson. This athlete had a residual of negative 23. Okay, and I'll explain exactly where that comes from a little bit later. Okay, so at this point we should recognize the components of a regression line. Okay, um, remember the line is used to make predictions about values of a response variable given a value of an explanatory variable. Okay, and we can use this for any value of the explanatory variable, but we have to be careful sometimes because there's a thing called extrapolation. Okay, right now on your screen, you see the same scatter plot with the same regression line. Okay, but the equation of that line can be graphed anywhere you know, the domain would be all real numbers because, you know, 
x-axis. Although if we think about it, sprint times probably have to all only be positive numbers, but that equation could be graphed for any value of x. Okay. If we're gonna use this line to make predictions though, we have to be careful because what if we try to evaluate the equation at a value of x that is not currently represented on the scatter plot. Okay, like if we try to make a prediction for someone who took 11 seconds to sprint. Okay, and I picked the number 11 because if you actually evaluate this equation at 11, you're going to end up getting a negative predicted jump. And of course, that's impossible. Okay, and the thing with extrapolation is if you go beyond the current interval of the explanatory variable, if you're doing extra beyond that, the pattern you're currently seeing that the line is modeling may not continue that far. Okay, of course, someone who takes 11 seconds to sprint might not jump as far as everyone else, but they're not gonna end up at a negative value of Y because they have to be able to jump something. Okay, and so it turns out that many of the predictions we make based on extrapolation are inaccurate. Okay, um, I have seen the AP exam before ask, would it be reasonable to make a prediction using this model for something else? Um, situation like this could say for someone who took 10 seconds to sprint or someone who took three seconds to sprint. Okay, and while we could plug those numbers in, since 10 seconds and three seconds were not values that we saw on the scatter plot in our current interval of X, X values, the pattern we're currently seeing may not hold in the same way. And so it wouldn't necessarily be fair to make that prediction. And so we would need to talk about how extrapolation could be dangerous in those cases. You can still plug the number in and get an answer, but you'd have to talk about how extrapolation might make that prediction not necessarily valid and not a very good representation of what someone who would take that long to sprint could actually jump. Okay, other parts of um, AP questions when it comes to regression and the least squared regression line often focus on interpreting the slope and intercept. So this is a new scatter plot with a new regression line. Okay, this came from a situation involving um, several different customers at a store timing themselves for how long it took to check out after they looked at how many people were in front of them in line. So you see there at the bottom left, there was someone with no one in front of them, it took them a very short amount of time to check out. As you move along the x-axis, it looks like I'm noticing a, a pretty strong positive association, which makes sense. The more people in front of you, the longer it's probably gonna take for you to check out because you have to wait on those other people. Okay, but what I've seen is the um, test makers will ask you to interpret the meaning of the slope and intercept. So we'll start with the slope. Okay, that's the predicted change in the response variable per one unit increase in explanatory variable. Probably learned in algebra class, slope is rise over run, or as X goes up by one, what is Y doing? Does it go up, does it go down? How much does it go up by? How much does it go down by? That's what the slope here represents. And so if you're trying to write an AP quality sentence to interpret the slope, you could say as the explanatory variable increases by one unit, the response variable is predicted to increase or decrease by the value of the slope and then attach your units to it. Okay, for an example here, the slope is the number attached to X, so that's 174.4. So in this situation, I could say that as the customers in line increase by one customer, the time it takes to check out is predicted to increase by 174.4 seconds. And I said increase because of course it's a positive slope. You see a positive association. If there happened to be a negative association and a negative slope, I would say the word decrease there. And the real key is that you include the word predicted. Okay, AP rubrics um, will ding you from an E to a P if you don't say predicted, on average, expected, what should happen, that kind of thing. Because if you make it sound like as every customer, you know, the number of customers in line go up by one, you will have to wait longer by 174 seconds. That's not necessarily true. You can see that in the data. There was someone who had three customers in front of them that had a very short wait. So it's no guarantee that you're gonna have to wait longer. It's just a prediction based on the data we currently have. If you're trying to interpret the intercept, that constant number in front, that's what we expect to happen when the explanatory variable has a value of zero. And so you can say something like, when the explanatory variable is zero units, the response variable is predicted to be whatever the intercept is, including units attached to it. So in this situation, the intercept is the number 72.95. I could say when the number of customers in line is zero customers, the time it takes to check out is predicted to be 72.95 seconds, as you can see from the example here. Okay, so the slope and intercept, 
The slope is the expected change in the response variable as we increase the explanatory variable by one. The intercept is the expected value of the response variable when the explanatory is, is zero. Okay, and you can use these um, kind of templates, so to speak, to help write your answers. Uh, multiple choice situations will often um, ask you to interpret one part or another of the equation. And one more word about the intercept okay, is because it's specifically when the explanatory variable is zero, it often won't make sense in context if you actually stop to think about what that intercept might represent. So in this situation involving the jump in the sprint, that slope is negative 45.7. So it's saying as it takes an extra second to sprint, so for every additional second, your jump distance is predicted to decrease by about 45 inches or 45.74 inches. But what that intercept is saying is if it takes you zero seconds to sprint, your long jump is expected to be 414 inches, which is a crazy number of feet. And of course, you can't actually take zero seconds to sprint. That's physically impossible. And that's due to extrapolation here. No one's taking zero. So be careful when you're interpreting intercept. Know that it might not actually make sense in context. Um, the AP exam typically doesn't ask you to interpret things that won't end up making sense. Um, but be aware in your classes that your, your teacher might throw a curveball at you and, and you know expect the unexpected there. Great, so let's do um, a roundup of this section. We've learned what regression lines are, how to use them, how to interpret slope and intercepts of them. And so let's look at a scenario similar to a previous AP exam question. A marine biologist studying a group of wild salmon collected data on the weight in pounds of female sal salmon prior to mating season and the number of eggs those salmon laid during mating season. So explanatory is how much they weigh, response is how many eggs they lay. A scatter plot of the data revealed a positive linear and strong relationship and the equation of the least squared regression line is as follows. Let us start by interpreting the meaning of the slope of the least squared regression line in context. If you're watching this on replay, take a second to actually try to write a response. Um, I will come in in about 15 seconds and reveal a sample response, but try to write this out. This is good practice for you. I'll pause for a moment. Coming back in about 10 seconds. And here we go. A sample response for this, that slope is 14.56. What I could say is the weight of the salmon prior to mating season increases by one pound, explanatory up by one. The number of eggs laid during mating season is predicted to increase by about 14.56 eggs. So I'm taking that slope, 14.56, saying that it's the predicted change in how many eggs the salmon is gonna lay, every pound additional that we add to the weight of that salmon. You can put this in any order. You could say the number of eggs laid during mating season is predicted to increase by about 14.56 as the salmon grows by one pound, like you can switch the order of it, but you gotta make sure that you've got increasing the weight by one pound, predicted change in the number of eggs laid, and including that number 14.56. That's the three things they'll usually be looking for to earn yourself an E on that part of the exam. So at this point, we've reviewed what to describe when we're looking at associations. We've met least squared regression lines. Now we're gonna talk about uh, these things called residuals that we could calculate from least squared regression lines and how they can impact the analysis that we do. Okay, so hopefully that regression line part, it's mostly just algebra and using some of your contextual knowledge from previous courses, um, but make sure you're talking about predictions. The response variables are always predictions. Okay, speaking of predictions, okay, residuals are what happens when our predictions are not perfect. Okay, these are just predictions. Error is typically involved. So there are real individuals represented on the scatter plot whose response variables might not match what the line says it's quote unquote supposed to be when you actually create a line of best fit or create the regression line. And what the residual is, is the difference between the actual observed value, the actual Y coordinate, and the value predicted by the regression line, AKA the Y hat. So the formula you might see that would not be on our formula sheet is that residuals are Y minus Y hat. I've circled the individual from before that took uh, 5.7 seconds to sprint, actually jumped about 131. 131 would be their Y coordinate but the y hat would be based on plugging 5.7 into the regression line that you see on the screen, which we, we saw earlier, was about 154. Okay, so 
the actual jump of 131 was 23 inches less than the predicted jump. Y minus Y hat 131 minus 154 is negative 23. So in context, that means that the athlete actually jumped about 23 inches fewer than predicted. They have a negative residual. And we can see that visually because that dot is below the line. The actual value of Y is lower than the predicted value of Y or the predicted Y hat. Okay, so you might get asked, you know, is this a positive residual? Is there a negative residual? What does that mean in context? Okay, there's a subtle point here. If you have a positive residual, it means the actual was bigger than predicted. Y minus Y hat gave you a positive answer. Therefore, the prediction was too low, was an underestimate. Okay, this is because if the dot is above the line, the line didn't go high enough to actually hit the dot, the actual value of Y. So on this graph you see on your screen right now, point B is the one with a positive residual. That athlete actually jumped farther than expected based on the model, the regression line. Similarly, negative residuals mean the actual value was less than predicted. So the Y was smaller than the Y hat, so you ended up with a negative answer when you subtract them. Therefore, the prediction was too big. And so the line is above the dot. Okay, and the line is above the dot. The dot is below the line, the line is too high. So some people get those confused. Positive residual ends up going with underestimate from the regression model. And a negative residual ends up being an overestimate from the regression model because the actual dot was below where the line was. For a positive residual, the actual dot was above where the line was, so the line was too low. The estimates are talking about where the line is compared to the dot. If you have a residual of zero, it means the actual value was equal to it. Therefore, the prediction was quote unquote accurate, went right on the money. So you see point C, it's not quite exactly a residual of zero, but it is a very, very small positive residual. Okay, so if the dot is on the line, the prediction was perfect. And generally speaking, small residuals mean good predictions. And this can go back to this type of association we were seeing earlier. If you have small residuals across the board, you have a very strong association because the predictions are actually very close to the real data. If the residuals are typically very big, that means you have a much weaker association. Okay, and the reason that the lines are called least squares regression lines is the goal of the regression line is to make the squares of the residuals as small as possible, the least squares regression line. So the line of best fit is the line that makes all those vertical distances the smallest squared sum as possible. And we'll see some more of that in part three. So if you're watching this on replay, I mean, you're like, I didn't, least squares, I didn't catch that. Tune into part three and I'll, I'll show a more uh, specific example of how that comes to be and how single points can really throw off the equation of the regression line. Okay, but for now, we've seen residuals. Let's go ahead and do um, another check for understanding. Same situation as before, same regression line with the salmon. Now I want, I want you to calculate and interpret the residual for a salmon weighing 28 pounds that laid 337 eggs. So those are actual values of X and Y. I'll let you uh, take a moment to do the calculations. If you're watching on replay, I'm gonna jump back in in about 30 seconds to show the work. So you might need to hit pause or if you can go through it quickly, it's all good. So there's a few things going on here. We have an actual weight of 28 pounds. So the value of X is 28. The value of actual value of Y is 337, but that's not the prediction. So first we need to make the prediction to get our Y hat, and then we can calculate the residual. So notice I've labeled the actual Y as 337. I've made a prediction, 326.14, by evaluating the regression line when X is 28, and then calculated the residual based on actual minus predicted. I end up with a positive residual of 10.86. And so my interpretation is, the actual number of eggs laid by the particular salmon weighing 28 pounds is about 11 more eggs than predicted by the least squared regression line. This is where you know 10.86 in context might not make a ton of sense. So I can say about 11, you know, 10.86 is the actual residual, rounded up to say about 11 eggs, more, more eggs than predicted by the least squared regression line. All right, let's do another one. This time you're gonna get slightly different information and I'll do another 30 seconds and review the answer. So if I have a salmon weighing 15.5 pounds with a residual of negative 21.14, how many eggs did that salmon actually lay? Hmm. I'll come back in about 20 seconds. You can pause it on the video if you're watching on replay, 
or just wait until I show the answer. And reveal the answer in about five seconds here. If you're not done yet, click pause until you're done and you can unpause and see the answer. Okay, but for this one, I'm given the residual, but that means that the difference between what actually happened and what was predicted to happen was 21 fewer eggs than we expected. So we should still calculate how many eggs we were expected to lay by evaluating this when x is 15.5. That's all about 144.14. And then we can use the definition of residuals to tell us, all right, the salmon actually laid 21.14 fewer eggs than that. Subtract that 21.14 from the prediction to get about 123 eggs. Another way you could have done this is set up an algebraic equation where you say, all right, I know residual equals y minus y hat calculate y hat, put the residual on the left, y minus y hat, I then add 144.14 to the negative 21.14, it still yields an answer of y actually being 123. Okay. So at this point, we should feel comfortable with what a residual is, how to calculate residuals and how to manipulate them a little bit um, in context. And one more thing you might see a little bit of is you might be given a residual plot instead of a scatter plot. All this is doing is taking the actual original scatter plot data and keeping the same x axis, so the same values of x, but instead of the y axis being the actual values, the y axis just shows all of the residuals. You can almost think of it like taking the regression line, whatever direction it's in, and flattening it. So now any dot that's close to the line has a very small residual, so the actual value of y was close to the predicted value of y. And now any, any dot that is above the line on the right has positive residuals, and any dot below the line has negative residuals. And so I've seen AP exams before. Sometimes they'll like circle a dot on one of the scatter plots and ask you to circle the same dot on the residual plot or do similar calculation questions using the residual plot. So um, maybe they circle one of the points on the residual plot and ask, you know, what was the actual value of y for this particular individual? So you'd still use the same value of x, make the prediction based on the regression line, and then do the same algebra we just did on the last one. Okay, so what residual plots show us is the residuals instead of the response variables themselves, it's just kind of like tilting the regression line and making that a flat line at zero. Okay, if the linear model is appropriate for the data, you will not see any pattern on the residual plots. This comes up sometimes that if you see a curved nonlinear association on a regular scatter plot. When you plot that on a residual plot, you will see a similar curve situation because the line doesn't fit the data very well. And we'll explore that a little bit more next time. Okay, but I wanted you to see what residual plots are right now. So at this point, we've reviewed what the associations we look for on scatter plots are. We've met least squared regression lines. We've talked about how to make predictions, what we're making predictions of, what extrapolation is, how to talk about the slope and intercept of regression lines, defined residuals, including calculating and interpreting them in context. And in part three, our final part, we'll start to look at these computer outputs, like where does this data actually come from? And we'll read those. You see some of the numbers you've already seen in this particular uh, presentation. We'll define those numbers along the bottom, that S and R squared that you see and we'll uh, go deeper into that meaning of least squares, and then we'll do some overall um, review and recap, practice problems, that kind of stuff. So be sure to follow us, think fiveable. Thank you for watching this. Uh, again, use the timestamps below if you need to go back and double check any of the uh, agenda items here. Thank you for watching on replay. Hopefully we'll see you live one of these days. Once again, my name is Jerry Kossoff. Thank you for joining us here at Fiveable.